Hello. Welcome. It's an honour and a very great pleasure to introduce and celebrate two new professors in our Department of Education this evening, Professor Vanita Sundaram and Professor Paul Wakeling. It's always good to celebrate success, and our department can take great pride in providing an environment in which students and staff have the chance to flourish and really excel. Paul and Vanita have worked in the education department for over a decade now, and during that time, they've become known throughout the university as champions of equality, diversity, and social justice. This convergence of thoughts and actions is perhaps somewhat surprising when viewed through the lens of their first encounters, though. Vanita describes meeting Paul when he was interviewed for a lectureship in the department. What she remembers most clearly is a slide he showed, apparently with considerable relish, displaying a picture of celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay wielding a large and very sharp butcher's knife. Paul got the job, <laughs> in spite or because of the slide, um, and moved into the office next door to Vanita. You can understand her being a little bit wary. It went both ways, though. Paul describes going to the staff room on one of his first days in the department and finding Vanita slouched in an easy chair, expressing a somewhat robust opinion about some students who hadn't done their work, and sounding, in Paul's words, a bit scary. <laughs> they quickly got beyond first impressions. Neither are, in fact, even the slightest little bit scary, and were office neighbours for the next 10 years. During that time, it's true to say that Professor Sundaram and Professor Wakeling have made an enormously valuable contribution to the university, the department, and the Centre for Education and Social Justice. Each has a different research focus, gender and sexual violence in Vanita's case, and access to higher education in Paul's. But both take theory and scholarship, and they apply it to issues of social justice and education, and then apply their findings to policy and practice. In short, they both make a difference. During the last decade, Professor Sundaram has built up a national and international profile for her research on tackling sexism, sexual har harassment and violence in education. She's advised the government on combating domestic violence and crimes against women and on the national curriculum sex and relationships education syllabus. She's been active within the city of York too, providing an outreach programme on gender stereotypes and expectations to six of the city's secondary schools. She led the department to a Gender Equality Mark Bronze Award, the first education department in the country to achieve this, and has just submitted an application for silver. Fingers crossed. Vanita has been influential in, in ensuring that equality for all is a constant and visible priority. Professor Wakeling was the first member of his family to go to university. He says that struggling to find funding for his MA fired up his sociological imagination, motivating him to study inequality of access to higher education. We're certainly glad that it did, because since then, Paul has become a key driver of change in the sector. His work has been instrumental in identifying inequalities in postgraduate funding and in suggesting practical solutions. For just one example, his research has had a direct impact on the development of the Government Master's Loan Scheme. Throughout his career, Paul has been successful in driving the, uh, has been driven by one main aim, making universities open to all. And it's clear that he's been very successful in driving this agenda forward in the UK and that he will continue to do so. The Department of Education is a very special department one of the university's founding departments. It educates the teachers who go out to nurture our children and young people, supporting them in becoming knowledgeable and skilled citizens. It educates undergraduate and postgraduate students, hundreds of them each year, who study education usually because they want to make the world a better place. 
Social justice is a theme that runs through the department's four research centres, with staff in each researching inequalities in opportunity and outcome, and new ways to combat those inequalities. The work of the two people we are here to celebrate this evening has made a particularly powerful contribution to ensuring fairness, equality, diversity, and democracy in education. And we are extremely proud to have them as our colleagues. Please join me in congratulating Professor Vanita Sundram and Professor Paul Wakeling and giving them a very warm University of York welcome. Okay, so first up we have Paul, Professor Wakeling. Um, Paul will speak for 25 minutes and then there'll be a chance to ask short questions, but a bigger question period at the end. Hello, thank you. Uh, and what a lovely welcome. Thank you, Catherine. So I'm going to talk this evening about uh, universities and whether they can be an engine of social mobility. Now, the human brain... It's a bit of a strange organ, in my experience. A couple of months ago, I spent the whole day cleaning the house, and I paused just briefly for one moment to read a book review. And then that evening, um, usually I'm a really good sleeper, but about two in the morning, I woke up and I couldn't get back to sleep again. Um, and the, the ideas from this review were going round and round in my head. So I jumped up, um, and I, I ran downstairs, and I wrote six pages out longhand uh, on, on A4 paper. Um, and uh, those ideas are connected to what I want to uh, say tonight. Now, despite then having spent several weekends gardening and cleaning the house and decorating and so on, I thought I might get a strange look for that, <laughs> um, this hasn't recurred. So I'll, I'll let you decide whether that's a good thing or not, um, judging on the quality of my argument tonight. So the question I've set myself this evening is this. Can universities be engines of social mobility? That's a question that's really preoccupied me academically, uh, really throughout my career as a student, as an administrator, as an academic. Um, and it's during that time, it's come to the forefront of uh, public debate. So without wishing to ruin the suspense, the answer I'll give to this question is as follows. First, we should be clear about precisely what we mean by social mobility, if we're going to answer this question. Point to students, always define your terms. Uh, second, we should be sceptical about universities as engines of social mobility. That is, as institutions which can, on their own, drive or engineer social mobility. But ultimately, I'll conclude that, yes, universities can and are important for social mobility, but not necessarily for the reasons that policymakers might uh, claim or expect. So we will start with a little history. Uh, well, actually, it's not a little history. It's a very large history, but I'll try and do it briefly. The growth of higher education over the last century or so in the UK and elsewhere is really little short of staggering. So if we go back just 75 years, uh, children in England could have no expectation of going to secondary school. Um, today, almost half of English 30-year-olds have participated in higher education. So whereas in the 1950s, most British young men, like my dad, entered the armed forces through conscription, very few young women or men entered university. There were only about 8,500 university students in 1950, which would only half fill the University of York today. Um, and the situation's reversed. So there are about 9,000 under 20s in the armed forces now, and 650,000 new UK domiciled undergraduates each year. The University of York, and there's the newspaper with its uh, establishment, was itself established during that first great wave of British university expansion in the 1960s. And I started as an undergraduate close to the second great wave of expansion in the 1990s. The American sociologist David Baker has labelled this jaw-dropping explosion of educational participation a quiet revolution. And I agree with him, it has been revolutionary. Baker argues that this expansion has been socially, culturally, and economically transformational, that we now live in a schooled society, the defining institutions of which are the school and the university. Institutions which are, to use the jargon, isomorphic, 
That is, they're increasingly like each other wherever they appear in the world. Now, whether you, or not you agree with his thesis, it's certainly the case that this huge growth in higher education coincides with other fundamental social changes that we've seen. Since the end of the Second World War, there have been significant changes in global wealth levels, life expectancy, infant mortality, literacy, cultural mores and forms of government. As we will hear from Vanita, there remain very significant and troubling gender inequalities in societies, which could and should be doing better. Nevertheless, women's participation in higher education has changed beyond all recognition, from being a small minority to a clear majority of higher education students, both here and elsewhere in the world. Importantly for the question I've set myself, we've also seen changes to both the class structure and to movement within, of positions within it. Consideration of these changes has been an abiding preoccupation of British sociologists, and central to this programme of research has been trying to map patterns and processes of social mobility within British society and establish where education fits into the picture. So while sociologists have been focused on social mobility since at least Peter M. Sorokin's 1927 book of that name, political use of the term is much more recent. In fact, if we look at data from Google Ngram, which collates um, the use of different terms within published books, we can see that actually the phrase uh, peaked within um, the, the sort of um, 70s and 80s. Um, but also, if we look at uh, trends over time in Google searches, it's going up. So it has now a strong um, political currency within the UK. All political parties profess to be in favour of social mobility. There's a social mobility commissioner. There's a social mobility action plan. There are 12 areas of England, including in Yorkshire, Bradford and Scarborough, which are social mobility action air opportunity areas. Um, and each of the secretaries of state for education since 2010 has expressed strong support for more social mobility. And Michael Gove in particular argued uh, and was fond of arguing that it should be an engine of social mobility. I think it's important at this point to be clear about our definitions. And within sociology, there's a rather uncharacteristic consensus about what we mean by social mobility. It's the movement or lack of it between different social positions within society, usually between social classes. It can be intra-generational, so within one lifetime, or intergenerational between the positions of parents and children. And sociologists usually focus on the latter, on intergenerational mobility, the class you're born, up, born into and the one you end up in as an adult. Uh, and social mobility can be absolute or relative. Absolute mobility is that um, amount of mobility within a society as a whole, um, and societies differ from each other in this regard. Medieval society, uh, very low absolute social mobility. The class you were born into is the class you die into. Relative mobility, instead, measures how likely someone from a given social class will be socially mobile relative to someone from a different social class. For instance, does the child of a barrister have the same chance of becoming a barrister themselves as the child of a barista? So this is an important distinction because of the changes to the class structure which have coincided with this growth of higher education that I was talking about. Compared to 60 years ago, there are more white-collar jobs and fewer blue-collar ones. There's more room at the top than there previously was, uh, although the process of that opening up has probably completed now. And this change meant there were lots of opportunities for upward mobility during the 20th century. So my job is a case in point. Um, so if you look at 1965, where I'm, I'm studying the background of professors, in 1965, in the eight disciplines I was studying, there were only about 450 professors in universities. And now, there are 3,200 professors in those same eight disciplines. So if we assume that each of those 1965 professors married or partnered with a non-professor, and they each had two children, then even if all of their children became professors, there would still be vacancies for about 2,300 professors. Um, so now we know what social mobility is, at least as the sociologists use it, why does it matter? There are many reasons why, uh, but here are two. So first, on a grand scale, we know that societies with higher social mobility have lower levels of socioeconomic equality. And there's evidence that societies with lower levels of socioeconomic equality do better on all sorts of other measures, uh, like health and happiness. 
And this has famously been described by York's own Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson in their book, The Spirit Level. The second reason is at the personal level. And many of us here this evening will know instinctively why social mobility matters, because we have personal experience of it, often by way of a university degree. Most of us, I think, would feel uncomfortable about a society where your fate is sealed at birth, um, rather than being a result of your own ability and efforts. And while there are vanishingly few positions which are not, in principle, open to all within modern Britain, a notable exception is the head of state, in practice, we know that long-range upward or downward social mobility is relatively rare, and this is unjust. So take the job of Prime Minister. It helps to be male. There are only two women among the 14 who have done the job since 1945. Well, actually, ever. And it also helps to be a graduate of the University of Oxford, because of that 14, 10 of the Prime Ministers were Oxford graduates. So there's a simple logic that getting more people from university and from previously underrepresented backgrounds into university or certain kinds of universities will help us achieve social mobility. The problem here is that the public debate has tended to collapse the notion of social mobility with that of fair access and widening participation to higher education. So while social mobility is about the connection between origin and destination, Fair access is just about getting into university and not what happens afterwards. With social science research on the question of higher education and equality, there's been a growing shift on the focus from access to the focus on outcomes and a little bit in policy. Um, but the question is whether access to university is sufficient to drive changes to social mobility. And to answer this, I'm going to turn now to look at some evidence from research I and my colleagues have conducted in two specific areas. The relationship between university attendance and social class destination, and another kind of outcome on which I've focused a lot of my scholarly attention, access to postgraduate study. So there's another spoiler alert here, I'm afraid, uh, and that's that my view is higher education has become the venue for wider struggles of social and economic reproduction. The competition between social classes to secure future advantage takes place through universities. Universities are sometimes complicit and sometimes resistant to those processes. But to butcher that politician's analogy, if universities are the engine of social mobility, someone else is controlling the clutch, accelerator and the steering wheel. At the very basic level, there's, evidence, there's little evidence that higher education expansion has led to a reduction in equalities uh, of access to higher education. So here's a figure uh, which demonstrates that point, which is from research I conducted with Daniel Lorison of Swarthmore College in America. Uh, we can see here that across birth cohorts, having an undergraduate degree is more common for people from all social class backgrounds, but the gap between people from different social classes has persisted, and we know this is a well-established finding within sociology. Um, by contrast, beyond specific professions like prime ministers, um, we know less about the effect of attending particular universities or types of university. Um, and it's also the case that the social class categories that have been used uh, tend not to distinguish very well between the, uh, the exceptionally advantaged and the merely comfortable. So through the BBC's Great British Class Survey, which some of you might have taken, um, a group of us look at, looked at social class again within contemporary Britain. And we had a very large sample of people with over 80,000 graduates telling us what university they'd gone to. Colleagues working on that survey, led by Mike Savage, formerly of York, and uh, Fiona Devine, one of my PhD supervisors, came up with a new model of social class, which included things like cultural indicators, uh, measures of who you know, as well as wealth and income. And the resulting seven class scheme included small groups at the top and bottom of society, the elite about 7% of the population, and the precariat. And our data showed that graduates were very differently distributed across those social classes. Uh, so very few non-graduates are in the elite class, and very few graduates are in that precariat class. But you can see that um, the, um, not all graduates are in the elite. In fact, only about 15% of them. And our data also allowed us to look at differences um, in terms of what proportion of each class was graduate. And again, here we can see that um, a majority of the elite class was graduates and only a small minority of the precariat. So 
we can see something about what being a graduate means for uh, your class position there. Our data also allowed us to look at differences between graduates of different universities. And here we've got the average household income of graduates from uh, those which are members of the Russell Group, which York is a member of, um, which is often held up to be the most prestigious group of universities in Britain uh, and includes some world-famous names that you'll recognise. And we can see here there's some real clear differences. Uh, notably, Oxford is there at the top, and Oxford and Cambridge usually put together literally as a portmanteau word of Oxbridge. Um, they're separated in our data. There are other universities in between them, and Oxford uh, household incomes are about 10% higher than those in Cambridge. Uh, we can also see, uh, unfortunately for the University of York, we're kind of down there in penultimate position, and there's something of a kind of north-south divide in these salaries, which I don't think is entirely related to the differences in salaries in these areas. What does this mean then? Well, first, clearly, it's no longer enough to be a graduate. While the elite is a graduate class, most graduates are not in the elite. And this is a real change since the 1960s when Kelsol and colleagues were able to write a book called Graduates, the Sociology of an Elite, which presumed that all graduates were elite. Um, so arguably, we've seen the, uh, the end of the 11 plus exam simply being postponed to 18 plus, where grammar schools have been replaced by comprehensive schools, but at the same time we've seen that strengthening of institutional hierarchies within higher education. And to some extent we see a similar pattern with access to postgraduate studies. Here we've got another quiet revolution. So while undergraduate numbers were growing so rapidly in the 1990s, so were postgraduates. And what had been really once a minority pursuit was growing so that it's now about a fifth of all UK students. And in the Department of Education, it's about three-fifths of what we do. Um, we know that graduates earn more than non-graduates, but postgraduate degree holders um, earn higher still. And there's probably quite a few postgraduate holders in here tonight who are quite happy to um, hear that news, although you may not feel it. Um, so for every £100 that a non-graduate earns, in the UK, a graduate gets... 154 and a postgraduate holder on average 174 pounds uh, a week let's say or in relation to them um, okay so returning to my argument that universities are more venue than players in social mobility we see such a picture when we see look at who accesses postgraduate study so here we've got data from the quarterly labor force survey which is looking at the social class origin of first degree graduates who went on to obtain a postgraduate degree by age group. And amongst this oldest group on the left of the chart, social class seems to bear no relationship to the likelihood of attaining a postgraduate qualification. So for this group, going to university was probably already enough to secure a good job. As we move rightwards across the chart into the younger age groups, we see that the social class differences begin to increase, such that amongst the youngest group of graduates, there are clear and statistically significant differences by social class background in the likelihood of obtaining a postgraduate degree. Now there are so many graduates, there's a clear advantage to having a higher degree. And while universities work hard to try to widen first degree participation, the social mobility terrain has already shifted under their feet. Just as we saw those institutional hierarchies in the Great British Class Survey, so we see them in access to postgraduate study. Old university graduates are more likely to go on than those um, from uh, new universities. And we also see um, some effect of educational attainment. That's a sum of the explanation, but not all of it. So here you can see that those with a higher class of degree are more likely than those with a lower class of degree to enter postgraduate study, which we would probably accept as fair. But we can also see that within each attainment band, those with a higher social class of origin are also more likely to become postgraduates, which does not seem fair. So we're left with an overall position, uh, impression <laughs> that's the very least disheartening. There are many people in universities with a passion and commitment to widening participation, but it often feels like the engine is revving and the vehicle isn't moving. Where might there be more grounds for hope? Well, here I turn to the book which woke me up. It's about the midlife crisis. In it, the philosopher Kieran Satir tries to bring his discipline's intellectual tools to bear to solve his own midlife crisis. In one particularly illuminating chapter, he borrows linguistics distinction between telic 
and atelic states and actions. And I think this gives a useful conceptual lens with which to understand both social mobility and indeed perhaps the nature of the university itself. So in referring to telic actions, satya means those things which arrive at terminal states, when, at which they are finished and thus exhausted. Things you can complete, like a degree, you can graduate and finish. Like getting a first, you achieve it. Like getting a good job or achieving social mobility. He contrasts these with things, with things which are atelic. So those things that don't aim at having a point of completion or exhaustion or a final state at which they've been achieved. Um, so, for example, studying or learning would be atelic. You can't finish learning. Doing meaningful work, it doesn't have an end point that you're uh, working towards. Same with feeling uh, rewarded or fulfilled or contributing to fairness and equality. So Satya's contention is that the key to overcoming his midlife crisis was to shift the emphasis on the value of things from the telic to the atelic. Social scientists have shown that happiness is U-shaped. It starts high in youth. It declines until the age of 45, which is my age at my next birthday. And then it recovers uh, as you get older. So according to Satir, at that midlife point, one is either left ruining past decisions, missed opportunities to achieve ambition, or else realising that having achieved them, any pleasure that they might bring is finite. Within an academic career, the inaugural lecture is perhaps the telic instance par excellence. It does give me, though, the opportunity to reflect on the value of education in general and of universities in particular. The prevailing discourse sees higher education as principally a means to an end. The aim at school, get to university. The aim at university, get a 2-1. After university, get a good job. There's nothing wrong with those aims per se, they're only objectionable if in isolation from the atelic part, learning, discussing, discovering, developing. The process of teaching and research is the best bit by far and has to be continually brought back to mind as a resistance to the telic emphasis we see in contemporary higher education policy, which emphasises those metrics that stack up, stack up completed activities, REF, TEF, NSS and so on. The same is true, of course, of degrees. The point is the experience and the kind of disinterested discussion for which universities are the only institution where this can be had. The point is not the summary degree classification which results like some sort of indelible mark, a judgment on the intrinsic character of the graduate. Returning to social mobility, the distinction between telic and atelic is key when it comes to the role of universities. Notwithstanding what I've already said about the limits on universities' potential to enable and facilitate social mobility, there is nevertheless a role for us to play in ensuring that students' potential is fulfilled regardless of background and that opportunities are offered through higher education for the previously disadvantaged to attain rewarding careers. We should certainly actively seek to resist the hijack of higher education by the already advantaged as a means of reproducing advantage, futile as that may sometimes seem in the wake of the empirical evidence we have. However, there is also a compelling critique of the discourse of social mobility developed by sociologists such as Diane Ray, Lisa McKenzie, Jeff Payne, and York's own Steph Lawler. Increasingly, social mobility does not imply that anything is done to address the plight of those left behind. It takes out a lucky few for success, but leaves the rest. Some see this as shoring the system up, or else robbing the working class of its potential leaders by co-opting them into the dominating class. And the process of social mobility can have side effects for identity and belonging, as many sociologists, including me, have described. Much of this hinges on what politicians or others are trying to invoke when they talk about social mobility. As I've already noted, and as others such as Jeff Payne and John Col Goldthorpe have pointed out eloquently, the term social mobility is usually misused. What is often meant when it is invoked is social justice, fairness, equality of opportunity, or better still, equity. This should give universities their cue. If we are to be engines of social mobility, then that must be done at least as much atelically as telically. Our contribution has to include, through our research and teaching, taking the impulse towards fairness, equality and justice from the social mobility agenda and embedding it as a process, not just an outcome. 
And we must remember that universities are symbolically important in these endeavours. If the ultimate purpose of the university is the pursuit of truth, then we are right to be held to higher standards. As we shall hear from Vanita, this should apply to gender inequalities and interpersonal relationships too. From the middle of my middle age then, I look forward with hope to a generation of young people who are driven by this impulse to make our universities and societies a better place to be. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And as, as we said at the end, there will be further opportunity for further questions. So thank you very much. And now I'm delighted to introduce Professor Sundaram. Thank you. For your inaugural lecture. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for those generous words of introduction, Catherine. Let's start. It's wonderful to see you all here. Um, I'm really overjoyed to be sharing the stage with Paul today. Um, he's been a friend to me and a solid source of support and advice since we started in the department together nearly, well, just over 10 years ago, at nearly the same time. Um, so it's a real honour and privilege to be sharing this space with him. Um, unfortunately, though, he always seems to show me up with his snazzy pictures of barristers turning into baristas or whatever it might be. You're not going to get that from me, unfortunately, just um, a number of famous creepy men, perhaps. Um, right, so I'd like to... Oh, no, that's the wrong way. I'd like to start, really, by offering a brief word of thanks. Um, I think the culture of academia can lead one to think that um, success is the result of an atomized individual effort. And academic work is, of course, a collective endeavor. And I would like to acknowledge the many colleagues, friends, and families who have enabled and supported me in a range of ways to achieve my own successes. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Department of Education. Um, the department has enabled me to do unapologetically feminist research on quite uncomfortable topics. It's a great privilege to work in such a collegial and genuinely supportive department and to work among such interesting and inspiring colleagues, many of whom I'm lucky to call uh, friends. I'd also like to acknowledge the many feminist scholars whose work I've built on and who I've collaborated with, some of who are in the audience today, um, and from whom I've learned a great deal. And of course, research is an emotional as well as an intellectual endeavour, and particularly so for the topics that um, I work on. Um, and so I won't spend the next 23 minutes of my time thanking individuals, uh, but I would like to give a huge collective thank you to the brilliant friends and to my family for providing uh, unconditional emotional and intellectual support um, in my journey to get here. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking about this work in my, uh, well, my work in this area today. Sexual harassment and violence are... Um, topics of huge academic importance. And of course, you'd expect me to say that. Um, but they are of significant societal importance too. Sexual harassment uh, affects the lives of women and girls in particular every day. Speaking to my peers, we roll our eyes at various forms of sexual harassment we all experienced in the school classroom. We despair about the fact that these forms seem not to have changed that much in the 25 or more years since we left school. We talk about the street-level harassment we continue to experience as adults, when we are standing in a bar, when we are out on a run, when we are walking to the bank, when we are queuing for a taxi home after an evening out. We share an understanding to avoid cutting through the park or taking the much shorter route home down a little alley after a certain time. We hear about the experiences of our own daughters, our friends' daughters, being followed by groups of men in cars, being whistled at, being commented on, on their way to and from school. We are increasingly aware of how women who are gay, trans, brown, black and disabled are differentially affected, how different women's bodies are differentially objectified and degraded. Sexual harassment and violence are ubiquitous. You need only speak to the women in this audience to know this. When I finished my PhD, my external examiner gave me a china mug with a picture of little Mai from the Moomins on it because, he said, she reminded him of me. She is described as quite small, fiery and irritable, among other qualities. I think it's pretty accurate. I'm sure my family would concur. Um, I think for me, this fire has always been lit when I've come across injustice. And I, from a young age, I remember feeling how unjust it was that girls were taught to dress, behave, speak, even walk in ways that would, amongst other things, ostensibly protect them from harassment from men. So this has probably been the starting point for my own work on violence against women and girls in seeking to understand why it is such a pervasive feature of our experiences, its impacts and how we can prevent it, 
and in particular through education as a primary context for socialisation. So today, on the basis of work I've conducted over 15 years or so, I will be arguing that sexual harassment and violence continue to be widespread in education and elsewhere, that it is sustained by gender expectations and norms which normalise and invisibilise these practices, and that prevention initiatives must recognise that these practices are not en enacted by a few problematic or troubled individuals. Gender inequality, which sustains sexual harassment and violence, is structurally and systemically embedded. Here are my famous creepy men. So one might argue that sexism, sexual harassment and violence have become hyper-visible in recent times. The Me Too movement has strengthened the voice of survivors and given them a platform from which to talk about their experiences. Celebrities, revered and powerful men, have been named at the centre of harassment and violence, often spanning decades and involving clear abuses of power. These men have been referred to as monsters, as evil, and have generally been cast as highly unusual, particularly problematic individuals who pose a clear threat to women and children. I will be arguing today that while these perpetrators have certainly been prophylic and more visible than most, that sexual harassment, misconduct and violence are masked and made invisible by a culture in which harassment and sexual violence by men against women is normalised. This culture is not specific to the media industry or to politics. Rather, such cultures pervade a range of contexts, including educational ones. I'll be drawing on research from four specific research projects I've conducted over the past eight years to answer two pertinent questions. Why are these practices so prevalent and how are they sustained? And secondly, what can we do about it? Can the culture that sustains such practices be changed? And if so, what factors need to be considered? However, despite the recent visibility of sexism, harassment and violence, these are, of course, not new phenomena. Neither is there any evidence that these practices are on the decline, despite growing awareness and attention given to these issues, and arguably progress made in terms of gender equality in a number of spheres. So, for example, in the general population, the Crime Survey for England and Wales suggests that one in five women and one in 25 men have experienced some form of sexual assault, which covers rape, sexual assault, indecent exposure and unwanted touching since the age of 16. We know that there is no significant change in the prevalence of sexual harassment and assault measured by the Crime Survey for England and Wales since 2005 when the module on sexual assault was first introduced. And in understanding prevalence, of course, we need to take into account under-reporting among all genders as more than 80% of survivors do not report their experiences to the police or other authorities. Sexism, sexual harassment and sexualized violence have been shown to be prevalent in educational contexts. The Women's uh, and Equalities Committee 2016 inquiry into sexual harassment in schools showed that sexual harassment and sexualized violence was prevalent even in primary schools. So as some examples from the report, 22% of young girls aged 7 to 12 had experienced jokes of a sexual nature from boys. Girls aged 9 to 10 reported boys lifting up skirts and pulling down pants, leaving some of them too scared to wear skirts to school. Research by Catherine Atkinson, a member of my own research group, has similarly revealed the ways in which very young children use sexualized language to objectify, humiliate and degrade their peers. So boys aged five were using objectifying language to discuss and evaluate their female classmates, judging their attractiveness in terms of their skinniness, among other qualities. Research that I have conducted with Professor Helen Saunson from York St. John's University has shown the myriad of ways in which young girls experience sexualized humiliation and harassment in secondary schools too, including in relation to their appearance, their assumed sexual activity, sexualized name calling and harassment using pornography. My own PhD research showed how experiences of harassment and violence have significant health consequences for women. We know also that these experiences have numerous negative impact on school-aged girls, including anxiety, low self-confidence and self-harming behaviours, as shown by the Girl Guide annual survey. So, in university contexts, <coughs> sexual harassment and violence have also been shown to be evident. Most of the focus has been on students' experiences of sexual harassment and violence, and the National Union of Students has conducted most of the research on this issue in universities. Their studies conducted in 2010, 2013 and 2014 show that verbal, physical and sexual harassment and assault are no less prevalent in universities than they are in the general population. Sexual harassment may also be image-based, such as the image on your left, which is typical 
is it your left? I think so. Which is typical of imagery mentioned by students as objectifying, degrading, or humiliating women students in particular. More recently, we've had a focus on uh, staff, staff to student sexual misconduct in the UK. And this is staff to student sexual misconduct in universities. In April this year, the first major stu study on staff student sexual misconduct since 1996 was conducted by the National Union of Students in collaboration with the 1752 Group, which is a national uh, research and lobbying organisation. In their survey of nearly 2,000 current and former students, 41% have reported that they had experienced unwanted sexual advances and innuendo from university staff. Women were twice as likely as men to report those experiences. And of the staff in the universities that, were, uh, that reports were made about, the vast majority of these were, perpetra uh, were the perpetrators were academics. Um, and um, as the statistics show, there was a gender imbalance in terms of perpetration. Again, underreporting remains a significant problem, with fewer than 10% reporting their experience to the university. Carolyn Jackson, who's a professor at Lancaster University, and myself, um, conducted the first UK <coughs> research project on university staff perspectives on sexual harassment and violence in higher education. And we found also that university staff had encountered a range of harassing or violent behaviour that encompassed abusive language, forms of online or digital abuse, and sexist behaviour too. So just some examples of the types of uh, uh, ex uh, things that our participants told us ha happened in social spaces. So I'll give you a minute to read that quote. And examples of um, sort of sexist um, and objectifying language as well. So while these practices were most frequently associated with social contexts in our study, our research found that lad cultures permeates into teaching and learning contexts too. Staff who described these examples of harassment spoke about the ways in which at such attitudes and practices were levelled primarily at women, women who were obviously not from the UK, women who were young and women who were new in their roles. So we had sexualized feedback, which research from the United States has also shown uh, is a common occurrence. And then um, kind of sexist disruptions or interventions within the classroom setting. I argue that understanding the varied and in some cases quite subtle ways in which harassment and abuse permeates university contexts allows us to think about sexism as operating in less overt and more insidious ways and thinking about the ways in which these practices create a cultural context for sex, sexual harassment and violence to occur. So that's the prevalence. Where does it originate and how is it sustained across educational and other settings? Sexist behaviours, values and attitudes associated with sexual harassment and violence clearly don't arise when people arrive at university. We know that young people are highly accepting of different forms of gender-based violence and over 20 years of research these views appear to persist. So in 1998 the Zero Tolerance Charitable Trust conducted a survey of over 2,000 young uh, men and women and found that 75% of boys or young men and 50% of girls or young women thought that women were often or sometimes to blame for violence perpetrated against them. Eleven years later, Christine Barter with the NSPCC conducted a similarly sized survey um, with young people about their experiences of violence and found that refusal to have sex, nagging and infidelity were cited as reasons for using violence against girls. In terms of understanding why it is that young people accept and justify violence, more recent research shows that young people's expectations of gender are pivotal to their understandings of violence as violent or not, and to their acceptance of different forms of violence. So Melanie McCarry's work shows that young men's understandings of what it means to be a proper man involves exercising control, establishing dominance and power over their partners. This sometimes involves verbal aggression, coercion and controlling behaviour. Or, and physical or sexual violence. My own work in this area has shown how young people are well versed in official and formal discourses about violence being wrong. But when young women in particular transgress expectations of good girls or how girls should behave in intimate partner relationships, a range of forms of violence are narrated as justifiable, acceptable and even deserved. Drawing on Liz Kelly's concept of the sexual violence continuum, I have argued that young people's acceptance of violence exists on a continuum also, rather than as a dichotomous conceptualization of violence as either wrong or as acceptable. 
and that their gender expectations mediate these views. So sexist values, sexual harassment and violence are explained away, justified and even viewed as a normal part of relationships by many young people. In higher education, understandings of sexual harassment and violence are also shaped by gender norms and expectations. Despite the fact that we know sexism, harassment and sexual violence to be evident in university contexts, this is not always acknowledged or problematized by staff working in these settings, and these are staff working in various roles. There are limited understandings of what constitutes sexual harassment, as well as entrenched gender blindness on the one hand and gender stereotyping on the other, which underlie the dismissal, trivialization and invisibilization of sexual harassment and violence in higher education. We might therefore think of universities not only as venues or settings for these practices to occur, but as conducive contexts for sexual harassment and violence. Research with university staff suggests that gen the gendered basis of harassment and violence is not always recognised, and there is a perception that girls can be just as bad as boys. Individual and exceptional incidents involving women are also used to extrapolate to a common sense notion that there is parity in these practices. There is a perception that sexual violence and harassment are not that common, and this is reinforced by underreporting by survivors, of course. So these quotes from participants with student-facing responsibilities are examples that suggest the ways in which invisibility is entrenched and language around harassment and violence reinforces the notion that it doesn't happen here. So in the first example, um, uh, head of department talking about having been in the university for 21 years and not having handled more than five or ten cases. And these types of quotes um, were actually fairly typical and should hopefully make people think about if there were five or ten cases that involved stabbings, for example, how would that be perceived by a member of staff working in the university or indeed by the university itself? And it tells us something about the ways in which sexual harassment and violence continue to be viewed as well as the ways in which survivors continue to be viewed. And the second example, a um, uh, uh, head of security talks about having female students come and report unwanted attention, but never having a feeling that this is a massive problem, or there were dozens of cases, which of course raises the question about how many cases is enough for it to be warranted, warranting of, of serious attention. The following two examples show the ways in which gender stereotypes are often deployed to normalise or excuse sexual harassment. They simultaneously show a th or indicate a theorization of harassment as individualized behaviors by naive or silly men. The ways in which harassment is deliberately used as a mechanism to intimidate, to exercise social power or control, is made entirely invisible in this type of narrative. And again, this was fairly typical of the views expressed by our participants. Ironically, our research has found that when sexual harassment is recognised by staff as pervasive, it becomes a reason not to report it. It becomes seen as so commonplace that it's normalised, as exemplified in this excerpt below. So what would I say to report? Because I could give you 20 reports from one night out. So you could argue that its ubiquity contributes to its invisibility, as it's not made visible to higher education institutions by students or staff through formal complaints processes or official policies. Sarah Ahmed, who has written widely on complaint in universities, has written that when sexual harassment becomes invisible, so too does the labour of trying to challenge it. How do we challenge a problem that we cannot see? She argues that those who work against harassment are often heard as complaining if and when they do speak. Ahmed argues that for universities trying to contain damage to their reputations, damage limitation takes the form of controlling speech of trying to stop those who speak about violence from speaking in places where they can hurt. To contain damage is to contain those who have been damaged. On the basis of our work and drawing on Ahmed, we argue that the educational institutions that continue not to have policies, processes or people in place to support survivors also maintain the invisibility and erasure of sexual harassment and violence and therefore allow it to be sustained. So what does existing research tell us are some factors that we need to address in uh, violence prevention initiatives in educational settings? In higher education contexts, we note that myths and misperceptions about the nature, the prevalence and causes of sexual harassment and violence are fairly widespread. We find that victim blaming persists 
and that there is a resistance to viewing sexual harassment and sexual violence as gendered phenomena, not only in the sense of their perpetration of victimization patterns, but also in terms of men's violence reflecting and reproducing particular expectations of masculine behavior. Universities UK has noted that to challenge sexual harassment and sexual violence in universities, we need to take an institution-wide approach to culture change. So at York, we have developed research and formed training programs for staff and for student leaders, which have sought to address some of these gaps in knowledge and to develop a culture of empathy and support for survivors as part of international and national projects. One of these training programs has now been rolled out at six universities in England. But how effective are these training messages at shifting cultural norms and values? Our ongoing process evaluation of this, pro of this program has found, on the one hand, significant positive gains in knowledge around understandings of sexual violence, around how to respond effectively to disclosures, and engendering empathy for people who have experienced sexual harassment and assault. However, a consistent participant criticism of the training across partner universities has been of its representation of women as the primary victims of sexual harassment and violence. So, for example, that there's too much focus on men as perpetrators and not enough about male victims. This suggests to us that teaching about the structural and systemic origins of sexual harassment and violence is not always well received. Similarly, a persistent theme of discussion across partner institutions has been around questioning the prevalence of sexual harassment and violence, with many participants raising the issue of false allegations, despite being presented with research evidence which contradicted their beliefs about this issue. So again, it suggests that myths and misperceptions that may recirculate victim blaming and the denial of violence persist after such training, which also leads us to think that possibly training is not enough, but that's beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about just now. Okay. So we could ask then, is violence prevention work that starts in universities simply too late? And I'm just, yeah, give a spoiler, as Paul did, I'd, I'd say yes. Um, as mentioned, the values and attitudes that sustain sexual harassment and violence clearly don't arise at the point of entry into higher education. Children are systematically taught to behave in particular gendered ways, including in their sexual and romantic interactions with each other. We know through prior research the myriad of ways in which early years, primary and secondary teachers reproduce gender stereotypes about boys and girls' abilities, their personality characteristics, romantic and sexual interests, and so on. Gender norms teach young men that they should be dominant, in control, authoritative, and they teach young women that they should be submissive, sexually unknowledgeable, and not too assertive. Within schools, these norms are upheld by pupils themselves as well as teachers and they have clear implications for negotiating consent, for understanding and confidently enacting boundaries in relationships. My work with Helen Sorensen has also shown how these norms are reinforced through the sex and relationships education curriculum. Our qualitative and linguistic analysis of sex and relationships education reveals not only how heterosexuality is promoted and foregrounded, but also how girls are held responsible for managing the risk of being harassed or assaulted by behaving appropriately. So, for example, by not drinking or by not having many sexual relationships. Boys, on the other hand, are pressured to demonstrate sexual knowledgeability and stamina. In sex and relationships education and in schools in general, gender equality, consent, pleasure, respect in relationships are not addressed. So looking forward, the directions I would like to pursue and I'd like the field to pursue include adopting a more intersectional lens in understanding how harassment and violence manifests for different categories of women and men across ethnicity, religion, sexuality, gender identity, disability and age. We need to better understand how whole institution approaches to prevention can be developed and how our knowledge about the role of gender norms in children's, young people's and adults' understandings of harassment and violence can be more effectively used in future violence prevention initiatives. Most existing educational initiatives still are based on a gender-blind, individualised understanding of the root causes of violence. So in conclusion, Work done at York and elsewhere shows that sexual harassment and violence is rooted in and sustained by social and cultural norms for gender. Public and some academic debates about sexual harassers or abusers have focused on the individuals themselves, imagining them as monstrous men, as unusually deviant or problematic. Responses to high profile cases in universities and elsewhere have therefore focused on sort of exemplifying punitive measures, individualized rehabilitation or penance. 
These practices are in fact widespread and can be understood as sustained by what Connell has termed the gender regime, which is embedded across a range of organizations. Thus, contexts that are conducive to gender inequality in various forms, including harassment and violence, are characterized by a gender unequal division of labor, a gender unequal distribution of power, and beliefs and discourses about gender difference that sustain this hierarchy. We need to address the structural and systemic nature of gender inequality and the ways this plays out in everyday actions and interactions as our starting point for prevention. Thank you. Unfortunately, um, our time is up, um, but before we go, I'm going to hand over to Maria Ayers, who is our Head of Quality, Diversity and Inclusion, to say a few more words. So, Maria. Uh, we're just going to be very rude and just leap in and say a few thank yous before um, Maria concludes. So, um, so first of all, um, Venetia and I would like to thank a number of people from uh, the department. In fact, everybody from the department. I mean, we've both been here 10 years. Um, and I think there's a reason that we've both been here for 10 years. It's not that we couldn't get a job elsewhere, it's because we really <laughs> like it. That's the point. Um, so I, I particularly want to thank, or both of us do, uh, Ian Davis, uh, Ellie Sims, Louise Chandler, and Sarah Day Hughes, and Nikki Henson, who have all been instrumental in uh, putting on this event and making sure it's gone so smoothly. And I think also making us feel a little bit special as mm. well. And I think that's we been, uh, really appreciated. Uh, and we'd also like to thank from outside the department, Maria Ayaz, Thank you. Uh, Colin Lamberts, the Vice Chancellor, um, Kath, what have you said, Catherine? I've got Catherine. Oh. So your generous words of introduction, thank you. And Tom Locke for putting up with, I'm going to say, five emails in the past 48 hours, at least, from two of us going, promise, no more changes to our slides. <laughs> this is it, final version. Uh, but thank you so much for your advice on the content and the images, as well as for humouring us with our multiple full-stop changes. Uh, and so I, I want to acknowledge personally uh, the people who've uh, paid for me in my research, so particularly the, the Higher Education Funding Council, which doesn't exist anymore, um, and the ESRC, which does. Um, a number of collaborators, but especially uh, Jill Hampton-Thompson, who's here tonight, and Sally Hancock, who I've worked together with a lot, uh, Daniel Lorison, who's uh, research uh, featured, Mike Savage, and uh, Fiona Devine, who I work with on the, uh, the Great British Class Survey. I'm absolutely thrilled that two of my supervisors are here tonight. So from my MA and my PhD, Chris Kiriakou and Mark Trammer, and especially uh, that my family are here tonight. And thank you for turning up and for all your support. Love you. Um, I'd similarly like to thank people who've given me money to do feminist research. So uh, the Society for Educational Studies, the Society for Research into Higher Education, the ESRC and the European Commission, as well as the university itself. Um, so thank you to those funders. Particular collaborators that I'd like to thank um, and whose research I talked about in the, uh, in the presentation are Carolyn Jackson, Pam Aldred, Alison Phipps, Helen Saunson, Debbie Ollis, um, Anna Stenson, uh, Laura Nicklin Reeves, both in the audience somewhere, um, uh, who've worked with me as research associates, and then also the Independent Domestic Abuse Services and Survive uh, in York. Um, I'm not going to say very much about my family because it's the kind of thing that tips me over the edge, but most of them can't be here, and really all I'd like to say is that without them, I wouldn't be where I am. Thank you. Many thanks, Vice Chancellor, Professor Wakeling, Professor Sundram, who are always Vanita and, and Paul to me, <laughs> uh, fr colleagues, friends, and guests. Uh, I'm absolutely honoured to be um, part of this lecture series to provide a few words at the end of such a thought provoking uh, number of lectures. It's the first time I've been part of an inaugural lecture where we've, we've had two great academics come together to share the platform. And I must say, your lectures on two different aspects of inequality have come together and complemented each other really well. And I think that dem that demonstrates the collegial nature of the Department of Education. As uh, Catherine introduced you, and through your lectures, what really struck me about both your lectures was that your passion to challenge and address gender-based violence and social mobility issues is driven not only through your scholarly and academic experience, but something that's been shaped through your own lived experiences, your observations, and deep-rooted values around 
uh, equality of opportunity. Paul's, Paul's lecture on access to higher education highlights the real issues higher education institutions are facing, in particular for postgraduate study. And without addressing some of these fundamental issues, we will struggle to challenge social and economic inequalities and change the diversity of our profiles, both our staff and students, but also within society more generally. Vinita's lecture on tackling gender-based violence strikes an important reminder to us all on the scale and prevalence of sexual violence within educational settings, but also the much-needed understanding and debate around the root causes of these, and also the longer-term impact if we don't challenge these and if these remain unchallenged. Both of these lectures have given us lots to reflect on, on a personal, professional and on a social perspective, but the key learning for us is, is how we will take this and apply such important issues of social justice within education to instigate cultural and institutional change. And perhaps that's the title for the next lecture series. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of everybody here, uh, I'd like to thank you for your lectures and look forward to your contributions as respected academics that will benefit your students, your department, and hopefully this institution and its practices and also the sector uh, and beyond now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. two very important tasks that I must do before I leave and the first one is on behalf of your department as a gesture of their appreciation for everything that you've done two small tokens of their appreciation okay there you go thank you department <laughs> and my final task of this evening is to invite you all to a drinks reception which will be in the foyer to celebrate this great evening okay.